Sean Frazier is the federal minister who oversees housing. Hi, Minister. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for making the time. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Would you have made the full suite of announcements that you've made as of today if there weren't a political imperative to do so? And by that, I mean if the Conservatives' focus on housing hadn't come at your party's immense expense in the polls? Well, l let's not pretend that uh, the only folks talking about housing were uh, elected of folks in the, uh, the House of Commons. Uh, when I was home last summer uh, and in the months leading up to it, uh, this is what people were talking about. Um, I'm one of the uh, younger cabinet ministers in, in Canada, and everybody my age and younger uh, when I'm at home is talking about the housing pressures that they're facing. Uh, we're taking our lead not from other political parties, but from Canadians who have housing needs that, that need to be met. And we believe that the plan that we put forward today sets the stage to solve the housing crisis and meet the needs of the people who've been telling us that they need help. And I have some questions about the specifics of that plan, but is it is it your contention essentially that it's this summer when you spoke to some of your constituents and younger Canadians that you decided the crisis what necessitated your government kind of meeting the moment? Because I would kind of contend uh, counter to that, that if you look at some of the housing prices and the jump in them from 2015 to 2021, a 97% increase, it was 811,000 on average across this country in, uh, by the end of 2021, that that issue existed for those young Canadians, particularly in markets like Toronto and Vancouver, well before your government started to try and meet that moment? Well, we started down the path of uh, doing things a little bit differently on housing when we launched the National Housing Strategy in, in 2017. Granted, the focus was disproportionately on affordable housing for low-income families. What we saw in the uh, later portion of the pandemic and certainly coming out of it, as people bought up the housing stock that existed when interest rates were very low and inflation was starting to take hold, we did see things were getting more and more challenging. In fact, the Housing Accelerator Fund, which I may have rolled out, uh, was in a budget that preceded my time in this office a few years ago so we had been doing more and more and more uh, but from my perspective when I came into this position in the summer the unique focus on housing not just in my own community but right across Canada uh, was something that I was hearing loud and clear uh, so we got to work to put together measures that we thought would make a meaningful difference which culminated in the plan that we've put forward today. If I think though about the nature of the crisis for example around rents part of a, a lot of that is part of what you're announcing in this go round. I mean the CMHC was saying back in October of 2023 that the uh, vacancy rate at 1.5 percent was down from 1.9 percent a full year earlier in 2022, which at the time had been the lowest vacancy rate in two decades. And, and the reason I ask about what the impetus or the imperative for your government to actually meet this moment, what, what it is about and, and if it's political in nature is because I think a lot of Canadians will be listening to this with great interest, hoping that your government will solve the very real problems that they're up against. And my question is, should they given your track record? Uh, we're not asking for anybody to believe in a promise. We're asking them to believe in a plan. Uh, we're showing our work. Uh, you know, you learn that in a grade eight math class. Uh, you only get full credit if you show you how you got to the answer. Uh, today, we are putting forward a full and comprehensive set of policies that we believe is actually going to solve the housing crisis. It's going to help build more homes at a pace we've never built before. There's measures to directly help people uh, that will make it easier to find a place to rent and to buy a home. And there's measures that are going to continue supporting people who can't afford a place to live. I hope people take a read of the plan that we put forward today and more importantly that they benefit from the policies that we implement going forward. But on those policies, for example, the one that offers low cost loans in order to incentivize the building of new apartment units, that's an expansion, a top up of a program that was first introduced in the housing policy you named back in 2017. So far in the last seven years, 11,000 units have been constructed and $18 billion loaned out. Is that if, if people are to look at your work or, or show your work, is, is that really the evidence that should give them confidence that these other plans will work? So you're talking about the apartment construction loan program, and keep in mind that it's common for the buildings that benefit from that program to take about three, three and a half years to complete construction because they have hundreds of units and are dozens of stories tall in most instances. That program has 11,000 units that have keys and doors, 32,000 units that have shovels in the ground, and 45,000 or so units with funding committed. That program's actually scheduled to deliver, uh, on schedule, 131,000 units 
finance through low-cost financing, which is money that gets paid back to the government, it's actually become a primary source of lending in the market for apartment construction in this country. So despite the fact that there's 11,000 units today, that's actually a reflection of the fact of how long it takes to build these buildings after the program was first introduced. That program's operating on schedule and is going to become a major tool when it comes to apartment construction right across Canada, as it has over the past couple of years. Do, do, you, do you contend over the past couple of years it is? Because again, I think for the average person, if they hear even 40,000 in seven years, I mean, you're looking at a gap of three and a half million additional units by 2030, according to the CMHC, we're talking in the tens of thousands. Uh, well, that's one specific program. That program is going to be responsible for about 130,000 units over the next number of years. The Housing Accelerator Fund is leading to hundreds of thousands of new permits that are being issued. The GST cut and the Canada Mortgage Bond Program combined for hundreds of thousands of units more. Each of the policies that we're putting in place uh, would never solve the housing crisis as a standalone policy. But when you look at the comprehensive suite of policies that are designed to do all of the things that we're trying to achieve, the sum total will allow us to solve the housing crisis. So the work that we're putting in isn't suggesting that any one policy is a silver bullet. It's part of a broader plan that's going to help us get where we need to be. Can we unpack some of the targets that, that you mentioned there in your pledge that this will restore affordability? I think what the plan says is 3.87 million new homes by 2031, a minimum of 2 million of those on top of the CMHC's forecast of 1.87 million being built anyway. So 2 million above and beyond what's already being built is short of what the CMHC has projected is necessary. Plus, in, in that 2 million, your government would be responsible for 1.2 million and the provinces for another 800,000. And not all the provinces are on the same page as you right now. They're accusing you, for example, of overreach. How can you tell Canadians that what you're promising, the, the totality of it in the aggregate, will actually happen? Uh, first of all, there's a few different estimates that uh, demonstrate what the supply gap in Canada ought to be. Uh, the Parliamentary Budget Officer recently suggested we need to get to about 3.1. The Smart Prosperity Institute is another organization that produced an assessment of the supply gap at about 3.5 million. We believe we can meet and exceed both of those targets. The CMHC supply gap you mentioned too talks about restoring a level of affordability that existed uh, about 20 years ago just through supply measures. We think we can get between the Parliamentary Budget Budget officers uh, estimates the Smart Prosperity Institutes and CMHCs uh, but we also are relying on other measures to restore affordability but you make an excellent point uh, no level of government can do this on their own and despite there may be disagreement here or there on a given issue I actually sincerely believe provinces and territories and cities want to be a part of this solution but we're not just asking provinces to step up. We're putting federal incentives on the table, backed by billions of dollars, for those most ambitious provinces who implement the reforms that we know will work. If certain provinces choose not to, we'll find a way to deploy those resources to support the most ambitious cities. It's going to take work. There may be disagreements by times, but that's the nature of uh, evolving policies in a federation. Uh, but we believe we can get there so long as provinces and territories meet the ambitious level of home building uh, that we demonstrated we want to achieve today. Well, I want to drill down on that because some of the incentives, for example, that you put on the table are not simply incentives. They're tied very much to a specific list of requirements. In the case of Alberta, they've tabled legislation in order to kind of block your government from going around them directly to municipalities, saying that if the municipalities are going to make agreements with your government, they're actually going to have to get approval from the province ahead of time. They've modeled that on Quebec's legislation. So my, my, uh, my question to you, Minister, is why your government has expressed uh, a criticism of what Alberta's doing and you seem fine with what Quebec's doing. So in the case of Quebec, uh, the most recent example is the Housing Accelerator Fund. Uh, that was actually an opportunity for us to reach an agreement that achieved a more ambitious uh, level of investment because Quebec actually stepped up and matched our investment. We put $900 million on the table. Quebec doubled that and implemented a series of reforms that were going to make it easier to build homes. It may be the jurisdiction where we got the greatest return on investment. If we look at the, uh, the uh, other example that you mentioned in Alberta, uh, we've put money on the table that resulted in precisely Alberta's population-based share uh, in uh, communities right across the province to accelerate the pace of home building, and we didn't see the provincial government match us. If they want it to reach out and say, we should have a province-by-province -province bargain, and we're going to match you and put measures in place it will accelerate home building. I'll take that call seven days a week. Right, but respectfully, Minister, the investments that you made in Quebec were not 
predicated necessarily on Quebec agreeing to every single reform. They still have that legislation in place. Why is it different for Alberta than in Quebec? Because they certainly view it that way. Look, they view it that way, and I, I have a different view of the situation. If Alberta, and I have a good relationship with uh, my ministerial counterparts in both Quebec and Alberta, I've spoken with them both a number of times, and both fairly recently. Uh, if Alberta wants to come forward and say, we're going to match your investment, and we're going to implement reforms that make it easier to build homes, we'll have those conversations with a goal of reaching a deal in good faith. I've not yet uh, seen that uh, that's something that they're interested in doing, but if they are, I'm here and ready to take the call.